Finance and House Ways and Means Committee will come to order. We have on the agenda today a presentation on the state budget by MMB. And I'm not sure if Commissioner Campbell or who is going to start. Commissioner Campbell, welcome to the committee. First, I'm going to have Representative Wiz Olson to say a few comments too. Uh, good morning, members, and good morning, public, and thank you, Commissioner and MMB staff, for being here to walk through, and thank you to the Senate for hosting us today, and thank you to the, all the House members that attended in person. We also are virtual today, so folks, we will try to pay attention and make sure that if questions come up later today that we will try to... Uh, both with folks in the room and who are on Zoom can be recognized. And so just uh, thank you everybody for being here at our non-normal house meeting time and making that accommodation to be here for this. And we won't be taking any committee action today, but we hope to have time for uh, discussion and questions after the presentation. And with that, I think we'll get started. So Commissioner Campbell, welcome to the committee. And team, we'll have you introduce yourselves too. Welcome, Commissioner. You can begin when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Charleston, and good morning. I'm Erin Campbell. I'm the Commissioner at Minnesota Management and Budget. Uh, and with me to present the February 2024 budget and economic forecast are my colleagues, State Economist Dr. Laura Kalmakidis and State Budget Director Anna Mingi. These twice-a-year forecasts are efforts to predict what lies ahead. We an analyze many data points in, in developing our forecasts, and they represent the best financial projections that we can provide based on the information available when we prepare them. Um, I, I uh, want to just recognize that a huge amount of work goes into these forecasts, both with MMB staff and, and also <coughs> staff from um, across the agencies, and of course we um, connect with your team as well. So um, appreciate all of that assistance. Uh, we did... Uh, announced that we've got good news to share. We are projecting an improved budget outlook over the forecast horizon. Uh, if you recall, during the November 2023 budget and economic forecast, we highlighted three points. Those points were that we had a U.S. economic outlook that was slightly improved, that we had a forecast, that we forecast a positive budgetary balance in both the current biennium and the next, and that we saw a projected structural imbalance. Those factors all remain true, but with some important improvements that we'll talk to you about this morning. Actually, oh, sorry. <laughs> all right, so as I alluded to in the last slide, our budget outlook has improved, which is great news. Uh, at the top line here uh, for the 24-25 biennium, we're forecasting a positive general fund balance of $3.7 billion. This is an improvement since November up $1.3 billion. The primary change here is positive developments on the revenue side of the uh, ledger <laughs> over the forecast horizon. The outlook for the U.S. economy has continued to improve in the near term, and higher than expected corporate profits in particular are driving projected revenues up from November. At the same time, spending is virtually unchanged uh, in the current biennium and up only slightly in fiscal years 26 and 27. The result is that the structural imbalance in the planning years is somewhat smaller, but it is not eliminated. Uh, the existence of the structural imbalance, again, means that uh, expenditures outpace revenues generated during the FY26-27 biennium. This slide shows the budgetary balance in the current forecast for 24-25 in that middle column compared to the November forecast estimates in the left column, and the column furthest to the right shows the change between the November forecast and this one. As you can see, there's a sizable, different, a sizable improvement in the revenues, uh, more than $1.3 billion, driven largely by higher corporate tax revenues. And you'll hear more about the rising corporate profits and tax receipts from Dr. Kalmakidis in just a few minutes. Spending is nearly unchanged since the last forecast, up $19 million. Uh, our cash flow count and our reserve remain the same. Um, uh, we adjust the budget reserve in November, but not in February. And then if you look at the bottom line in bold, uh, you can see that we now expect to end this biennium with a $3.7 billion uh, budgetary balance. Again, $1.3 billion more than was anticipated in our November forecast. 
this projected balance or surplus will carry over into the next biennium if it's not spent in this biennium, and that increases the available resources for that budgetary <clears throat> period. This chart shows how the FY24-25 surplus would impact the FY26-27 uh, balance based on current law. So on the left, the FY24-25 projected balance of $3.7 billion is depicted in the dark <clears throat> blue bar. If left unspent, again, those dollars will carry over into fiscal years 26 and 27. And then moving to the right, we expect baseline expenditures in FY26 and 27 will outpace revenues generated in that same biennium by $636 million. And you can see that in the first light green bar. This number is a little bit smaller than it was in November uh, due to the projected increase in revenues in FY 26 and 27. When you add that to the $842 million in anticipated inflation to maintain that same level of services <coughs> going forward, which is shown in the uh, green bar farthest to the right, you get a total structural imbalance of about $1.5 billion. And so while a structural uh, imbalance remains, we are grateful that it is less than the $2.3 billion structural imbalance that was forecast in November. Uh, after you account for the imbalance and provided the project, uh, excuse me, the projected surplus from the current biennium isn't spent, we do project a budgetary balance of $2.2 billion at the end of the FY26-27 biennium. And that is an improvement uh, from the projected $82 million that was <coughs> forecast in November. Uh, as was the case in November, the surplus projected in this current biennium helps to mitigate the imbalance in the planning years. And while projected surpluses in each biennium grow in this forecast, it's worth noting uh, that caution is still needed uh, when it comes to ongoing spending. The existence of a structural imbalance uh, will be of note to our rating agencies, and the imbalance, of course, will need to be addressed in the next biennial budget. Uh, in order to protect the investments made in programs and to serve Minnesotans, uh, we just want to make sure that policymakers understand the implications of um, spending in this by name on the next. Uh, and with that, I will um, turn it over to Dr. Kalamakitis to go through the next few slides. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Kalamakitis. Please introduce yourself and sure. proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Campbell. For the record, I'm Laura Kalamakitis, Minnesota State Economist. So I'm going to start with the U.S. outlook and how it has changed since November. I'll move to Minnesota's economy and then turn to details of our new revenue forecast. Since Minnesota's budget and economic forecast was last prepared in November, U.S. real GDP has grown faster than forecast, including unexpectedly robust real GDP growth in late 23, and financial conditions eased following the Fed's December meeting. This, along with continued strong U.S. employment growth, prompted S&P Global Market Intelligence, Minnesota's macroeconomic consultant, to raise their GDP forecast for years 24 through 27. <clears throat> In this outlook, U.S. economic growth slows. So this is the, the overall macro story here, is that U.S. economic growth slows, the U.S. unemployment rate rises as the labor market eases, and inflation settles at the Fed's target, allowing growth to persist through our forecast years. In this first chart, we're showing the S&P forecast for annual growth in U.S. real GDP. The light bars show the November forecast, and the dark bars show the history and the current forecast, the one that informs our current forecast. The Bureau of Economic Analysis now estimates that real GDP grew by an unexpectedly strong 3.2% annual rate in the fourth quarter of 23, and S&P expects that strength to carry into or through 24. S&P now anticipates real GDP will grow 2.4% this year, one percentage point higher than in their November forecast. Growth in 25 is now expected to be 1.6%, up from 1.4% in November. Over 24 through 27, annual real GDP growth is now expected to be 0.3 percentage points faster than in the November baseline. 
Note, when you look at the blue bars that you see it at deceleration or the slowing growth uh, that I talked about, where growth moves from 2.5% in 23 uh, to less than 2% in the planning estimate years. The next chart illustrates the federal funds rate, the Fed's policy interest rate. The blue line shows the history and the February forecast, and the gray line shows the November forecast. S&P now anticipates a monetary policy path that lowers the federal funds rate sooner than they had expected in November. In their prior forecast, S&P expected the Fed to raise the federal funds rate in December of 23, and that didn't happen. So in their February forecast, S&P expects the Fed to implement a policy pivot and begin lowering the federal funds rate in May, followed by three more cuts by the end of this year, bringing the rate, the federal funds rate, below 3% in late 25. So you can see on this chart, the green line goes up. That's the December rate increase that S&P had expected, and then the blue line um, doesn't have that increase in it, and we follow a slower path, a lower I'm sorry, a lower path than for interest rates than what we had before. So that's the easing of financial conditions that I talked about in my, in my introduction. This next chart illustrates the forecast path of inflation, the annual percent change in the consumer price index. Higher prices, including for food and rent, drove inflation to 8% in 22. Then we had declines in agricultural and energy prices, and we had the resolution of supply chain issues. So these supply chain issues were exacerbated during the pandemic and then again uh, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. But a lot of those supply chain issues have resolved since then. And we also had action taken by the Fed through that period, and those things brought annual CPI inflation down to 4.1% last year. The dashed line illustrates, which is the forecast, that illustrates the soft landing you've heard about uh, as inflation, CPI inflation falls to 2.8% this year. So again, in this outlook, a period of slower U.S. real GDP growth and a rise in the unemployment rate allow inflation to settle at the Fed's objective and for the Fed to hold its course. Uh, this is, again, the percentage ch annual percentage change in the consumer price index that's not the, um, that's illustrative of consumer inflation, or that's, uh, that's the headline inflation rate. Um, that's not the inflation uh, number that the Fed targets, uh, but this is illustrative of that pattern. The next chart uh, illustrates the forecast change for the dollar value or the level of U.S. corporate profits. The dark line shows the history and the current forecast. The dashed line shows the November forecast, and the gray bars show U.S. recessions. Focusing on the history of corporate profits, the graph illustrates the significant run-up in profits since the pandemic recession, a period when U.S. corporate profits grew at a compound annual rate of 7.5%. This coincides with years when Minnesota's corporate tax receipts often exceeded our forecasts, even as we repeatedly raised those forecasts. And the period since the recession also illustrates the volatility of the corporate of corporate profits. So you can see it's you know this jagged pattern because corporate profits were moving. Um, uh, the the changes were uh, were high every year. Um, now look at the right hand side of the graph to see the forecast period. The level of profits is now expected to be higher throughout our forecast period compared to November. S and P expects before tax corporate profits will grow. 5.6% uh, this year before experiencing small declines in the next two years and pivoting back to moderate growth thereafter. The November forecast, the dashed line, called for a sharper decline and lower levels of corporate profits in the out years. Minnesota's corporate, ta corporate franchise tax applies to C corporations that do business in the state, so our corporate tax receipts are correlated with the U.S. corporate profits you see here. The next chart shows biennial Minnesota corporate tax revenue. So I'm jumping ahead a bit to a revenue story because I wanted to juxtapose that corporate profits picture with the corporate tax revenue picture. So this is biennial Minnesota corporate tax revenue. The blue bars show the history and the green bars show our forecast for corporate tax revenue in the current and next biennia. 
So notice from the 1415 biennium through FY 1819, Minnesota corporate tax receipts averaged $2.7 billion uh, per biennium. In the FY 22-23 biennium, during that post-pandemic run-up period in U.S. corporate profits, Minnesota cor Minnesota's corporate tax receipts were twice as large at $5.7 billion. In our current forecast, Minnesota's corporate tax uh, receipts are now expected to average $6.2 billion per biennium in 24-25, uh, the current biennium, and 26-27, the next biennium. Um, you can't see it in this chart, but as Commissioner Campbell mentioned uh, in her remarks, we've raised these forecasts since November, and I'll discuss that in the context of the full revenue forecast in a minute. Moving to Minnesota's labor market, this chart shows the official unemployment rates for Minnesota in the dark line and the U.S. in the green line. The state's labor market has eased somewhat from the record low unemployment rates and record high job vacancies that we experienced the last two years. But unemployment in Minnesota remains low with a rate of 2.9 percent, 0.8 percentage points below the U.S. rate. And both of those rates, the U.S. and Minnesota unemployment rates, have, have remained fairly stable over the last two years. In this outlook, S&P expects the U.S. unemployment rate to rise to a peak of 4.4 percent in late 25. This is the rate S&P estimates that represents full employment or the level of unemployment that will not accelerate inflation. So it's consistent with that falling into this lower inflation pattern. Um, as the U.S. unemployment rate is expected to rise, we should expect to see Minnesota's unemployment rate rise over this period, too. Um, uh, then the, the box in the upper left, we illustrate uh, some other aspects of Minnesota's labor market. Uh, at 68.1 percent, Minnesota's labor force participation rate is 5.6 percentage points above the U.S. rate of 62.5 percent, and it's the fifth highest among U.S. states. And as employers around the state will tell you, we still have strong demand for workers across the state with more than two job openings per unemployed worker statewide. A crucial variable influencing Minnesota's individual income tax liability is total wage and salary income. So the total amount of uh, payroll wages and salaries paid out across the state. As employers work harder to fill open positions and businesses make investments in technologies that enhance productivity, wage and salary income per worker or average wage income is expected to increase. Uh, this a chart shows the annual percentage change in total wage and salary disbursement. So again, the sum of all the payrolls of all the employers across the state and the height of the bars shows how much that is expected or how much that has grown per year, how much we expect it to grow per year. The blue bars show the history and our current forecast and the green bars show the November forecast. In November, we forecast that total wage income, the sum of all wages distributed, would increase 4.8% in 24. We now expect wages to grow 5% this year and decelerate to a stable growth rate of 4.2% per year for years 25 through 27. The demographic reality of Minnesota's baby boomers aging out of the workforce continues to limit employers' ability to add jobs, because you can only count a job when you've got somebody in the job, so these are not job vacancies, these are filled jobs. Slow employment growth together with that stable wage and salary growth means that average wage growth or growth in employment per worker is expected to be the primary driver of growth in total nominal wage income through our forecast horizon. Turning now to the revenue forecast, the first two columns of the table show our current forecast for the current biennium and the change since November. And the second two columns show the same thing for the next biennium. Total revenues for the current biennium are now forecast to be $1.343 billion more than the November forecast. Individual income tax receipts are expected to be $449 million more than the prior forecast. Uh, we have we start our forecast with a with a base year of known tax or known or estimated tax liability, and our base year for the income tax forecast this time is tax year 22. Uh, we had to estimate 22 tax liability in November. We now know what it is, so we now know that income tax liability for 22, our base year, is lower than we had estimated in November, lowering the starting point for the income tax. 
And then we have a lot of one-time technical adjustments, which on net raise income tax receipts in this biennium, and those offset the lower base year liability estimate. The sales tax is now forecast to generate $126 million more than the prior estimate. This is due to higher than expected net sales tax receipts so far in FY24 and a higher near-term forecast for taxable sales compared to November. For the corporate tax, a higher starting point for the forecast, also from higher receipts so far this fiscal year, and the higher expected corporate profits that I illustrated earlier, raise our revenue forecast by $749 million over our November forecast. Total revenues for the next biennium are now forecast to be $907 million more than in November, primarily due to a, um, a large uh, a large that the large increase in forecast corporate tax receipts. Um, in the next biennium, uh, we have a small reduction in the income tax forecast. That's lower because it that in that biennium doesn't benefit as much from some of those one-time technical changes that raised the current biennium forecast. And then, if you focus just on the first columns for each of the biennia, the um, the columns labeled February 24 forecast, and just look across the line at the dollar amounts there, you'll see that all the major tax types grow from the current biennium to the next, and that reflects our expectation of continued economic growth. I'll fi finish with some, by highlighting some of the risks to this forecast. The current baseline forecast assumes that the econ U.S. economy slows, as I showed in the first chart, that the unemployment rate rises and inflation falls to the Fed's target. Um, and then S&P, again, assumes the Fed's policy reversal. The first interest rate decrease occurs in May of 24. So that's, the, that's what's baked into this forecast. But international conflicts, for example, in the Middle East, the Red Sea, and between Russia and Ukraine, pose a risk to the inflation forecast through potentially higher shipping, commodity, and energy costs. If inflation persists above the projected level, the Fed may postpone the policy reversal, or even choose to raise rates again, moving the economy off of the forecast path. Um, the federal government has, is, uh, is, is still um, negotiating, um, doing budget negotiations. Uh, in th this outlook assumed that no government, sh that a government shutdown, a federal government shutdown would be averted. Um, and if, they, if a shutdown does occur, um, especially one that is prolonged or affects the, a large part of the government, that would disrupt the economy. And then I put in a, a bullet point here about upside potential this time. Higher productivity growth, perhaps from emerging technologies and investments in those, could boost medium to long-term economic growth, even if additions to the labor force continue to be modest. And then with 17 months remaining until the end of the 24-25 biennium, even small changes in assumed rates of growth in important income sources, and especially volatile income, income sources, like capital gains and corporate profits, so that volatile corporate profits chart I showed you, can generate large changes in the outlook for this biennium. Even more, the difficulty of projecting long-range economic conditions and taxpayer responses to law changes warrants particular caution when using forecasts for the next biennium. I'll now turn it over to State Budget Director Ana Mingi. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Budget Director Mingi. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning. I'm State Budget Director Anna Mingi with Minnesota Management and Budget. This morning, I'm going to walk through changes to the general fund expenditure forecast and then turn it back to the commissioner who will walk through our long-term budget outlook. So we can go to the next slide where you'll see this table similar to the um, table you just saw from Dr. Kalambakitis, and it lays out projected general fund spending by major programmatic area in the current biennium as well as the next. You also see that there's a column for each biennium showing the changes from our previous estimates, the November 2023 forecast. So if you look at the very bottom line of the table, you can see that total general fund spending is largely unchanged from the November 2023 forecast. Spending is projected to be $70.5 billion this biennium, which is an increase of $19 million, which is less than one-tenth of 1%. 1 
State spending is projected to decline from the current biennium to the next due to significant one-time spending appropriated this biennium. So you can see total general fund spending in the 26-27 biennium is projected to be $66.3 billion. And that is a $75 million increase from the November forecast, which is about one-tenth of 1%. 1 so now I'm going to walk through the table, sort of getting into some of the big drivers of that change. You see the first line, E12 education, as you all know, is the largest area of general fund spending. It's, we're projected to spend about $24.5 billion this biennium, growing um, to about 25.6 in the next biennium. Our forecast of E12 spending is up in both the current biennium and the next. And this is um, due primarily to higher than expected actual special education expenditures in fiscal year 2023. As you all know, um, the special education funding formula is very complicated, but it is one of the formulas in the state budget that is driven by actual costs. And in this case, it's costs that school districts and, um, incur in the previous year to provide special education services, the majority of which are for payroll and fringe costs for personnel. So what, um, what we see in the data is that in 2023, school district costs increased by almost 6% compared to average growth rates of three to 5%. And so that raises both what we paid actually as well as our expectations of future um, spending. Moving to the next line, health and human services is the next largest but the fastest growing spending area in the general fund. This biennium is forecast to be 21.1 billion, um, projected to grow to 22.9 billion in the planning years. HHS spending is projected to be slightly lower, $10 million this biennium, and slightly higher, $17 million in the next. In both biennia, medical assistance spending is expected to be slightly higher due to um, higher than predicted spending in long-term care programs. But similarly, in both biennia, we're projecting slightly lower spending in non-medical assistance areas, things like the Child Care Assistance Program and Minnesota Family Investment Program. So what we're seeing here is in the first biennium, those savings in programs like MFIP and CCAP more than outweigh the cost growth in medical assistance, but out in the tails, the, um, the savings are not as significant, so the cost growth in medical assistance is sort of outweighing that, the, the savings. The next line, property tax, aids and credits, we're projecting a $5 million increase in the first biennium and $1 million decrease in the tails relative to the November estimate, so very small change. Moving on to uh, state debt service on capital expenditures, the forecast for debt service is $4 million lower in 24 and 25 and $10 million higher in 2026 and 2027. Lower interest rates drive the lower projected spending in the current biennium, but this forecast also assumes a larger 2024 bonding bill than our previous um, forecast. This forecast assumes a $980 million GO bonding bill. Um, it passed in the 2024 session as compared to $830 million assumed in the November forecast. So this increases projected costs for the 2026 and 2027 biennium. All other areas of the state budget are now estimated to cost $8 million less in the current biennium and $33 million less in the planning years. The largest driver of this reduction out in the tails is lower expected spending for metro mobility, which is forecast to cost 23, no, $25 million, which is about 11% less than previous projections, due to higher estimated revenues due to being a medical assistance service provider. So this. Uh, you know, this reduces the amount of funding the state needs to provide through the general fund appropriation. So the last line I'll highlight is our estimate of inflation. As this committee um, knows, the expenditure forecast now includes an estimate of discretionary inflation in um, the planning years or in biennia where we don't have an enacted budget. This number is an estimate of the cost of funding um, state services as prices grow for places where statutory formulas don't already provide for automatic adjustments. The current estimate of inflation in the next biennium is $842 million. This is a $38 million reduction from our November estimate of $880 million. We sometimes refer to this figure as discretionary inflation because it's only calculated for programs where funding formulas don't already include factors to adjust for changing prices. In the 2025 legislative session, policymakers will have to decide whether or not to appropriate this money 
um, to address inflationary pressures or whether to allocate it to other initiatives or to leave it unspent. So that um, when you look at all of the changes across those line items brings us to the total spending changes that I um, discussed earlier of $19 million up in the first biennium and $75 million uh, up in the next. And with that, I'll turn it back to the commissioner. All right, thank you, Anna. Uh, this slide shows the long-term budget outlook. In the middle column, you see that uh, with a beginning balance of $16.5 billion in this biennium, revenues that are projected at nearly $61 billion and spending to, uh, projected to be about $70.5 billion, we have a net uh, $3.7 billion after you account for the reserve and the cash flow accounts in this current biennium. When you move to the far right column, uh, we show that although spending in FY26-27 is lower than projected spending in FY24-25, we estimate that expenditures will exceed revenue projections in the out years by about $1.5 billion. Uh, we expect to end FY26-27 with a positive balance of $2.2 billion, again is due in large part to the surplus from this biennium that would carry over into the next if it's not spent this year. And in summary, I would just again note uh, that this was a forecast that had a lot of good news to share. Uh, the outlook for the U.S. economy continues to improve, and with it, corporate earnings and taxes. Uh, in fact, revenues from all major tax segments, uh, individual income, general sales, and corporate franchise taxes are all expected to grow. Forecast 24-25 spending is virtually unchanged uh, since our last forecast and is expected to rise only slightly in the next biennium and our cash flow and budget reserve accounts are fully funded. Our forecast surpluses for both biennia are higher than we projected in November uh, and uh, just provided that they're not spent. Uh, while a smaller structural imbalance is welcome news, uh, the fact that we continue to have a structural imbalance is something that we're all gonna need to um, contend with um, specifically as it relates to ongoing expenditures. Uh, but Minnesota remains on very strong fiscal footing and projected growth in the national economy and in the state revenue picture are something that we can celebrate. Uh, we know that prudent policy decisions that are made today pay dividends in future years and ensure that we can continue to provide the needed services to uh, the people and communities across Minnesota. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you all for the presentation. And I do appreciate on the last slide, you point out that the projected spending is lower next by him, even with the inflation. You have the footnote there, even yeah. with the inflation counted in. So, are there questions from the committee? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, welcome to our House brothers and sisters. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think my question is for Dr. Mm -hmm. Colin Makitas. Um, appreciate very much the way you characterize the national GDP and its. Um, difficult uh, estimates, you know, and I take this to be somewhat conservative. Could you say a little bit about what it might mean for Minnesota revenue going forward if GDP for 2024 was 3%? Not to try to pin you down or anything. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, members of the committee, if GDP went, if U.S. GDP were 3%, so, if in the, the, the model that we're working with and the, um, the, structure, the structural model of the economy that we're working with uh, would say that if GDP growth were a lot higher this year than forecast, it would likely be accompanied by inflation that is also higher than forecast. And if inflation is much higher than forecast, then we would also have to assume that the Fed would respond to that and that the Fed would um, raise interest, potentially raise interest rates, at least hold off on lowering interest rates and potentially raise interest rates in order to slow the economy to a, to a rate of growth that allowed inflation to come down. So that's the, that's the mechanism that I think would be triggered if economic growth, U.S. real GDP growth were higher this year. Um, without any other, all other things, all other things held constant. So looking into out years, um, you know, one of the, the upside potential I talked about was productivity growth. So 
um, a, for, a forecast that had higher growth in the out years um, would, would suffer from this same inconsistent story, right? So too much, too much growth means too much inflation, which means the Fed acts to put on the brakes and growth comes down. Um, productivity growth through uh, investment in new technology, for instance, could potentially raise U.S. real GDP growth um, above forecast and not be inflationary if there's some, you know, if there's some structural reason for that to happen. Chair Olson. Thank you. And we have uh, Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. A question for you, too, is uh, I know that oftentimes we look at migration of per per people in the state. Uh, sometimes we get more coming in than leaving. Sometimes we have, it seems that likely we have more people leaving than coming in. Have you done analysis on whether or not we have any wealth migration back and forth? And is that built into this, these projections as well? Dr. Kalmakidis. Um, Madam Chair, uh, representative members, Minnesota, in Minnesota's state revenue system, we, we looked at the income tax, we looked at the, um, the corporate tax, the, the sales tax. We don't have, we don't directly tax wealth, so we aren't directly forecasting um, the amount of wealth in the state and how wealth uh, moves in and out. Uh, regarding my movements of people, in and out of the state, uh, our forecast is consistent with um, what we know up to now about uh, the number of people moving in and out of the state and uh, consistent with projections by the um, State Demographer's Office. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I kind of, to piggyback if I could off of Senator Frentz's uh, questioning about GDP, um, have you ever seen an increase of 1% in four months in a projection like that? I mean, so we, we're we pretty flat on all the other projections, but conveniently for 24, it jumped from November, it went up a whole percent. I mean, that that's quite a jump, and then to have that jump and then have it flatten out in the tails, can you just elaborate on why and if you've ever seen a 1% jump in four months in a projection before. Thank you. Dr. Kalmakidis. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, members of the committee, probably. I've, I, can't, I can't exactly say what, I can't, I can't say for sure. But changes, even big changes in the economic outlook over the course of months are not that uncommon. Um, those of you who have been watching our forecast for a long time know that especially uh, since the pandemic, the economic forecasts have changed a lot from time to time. And so we are uh, forever you know, catching up to what the economy is actually showing us. Um, the economy, since, especially since the pandemic, has behaved in ways that are unpredictable. Uh, this was a, you know, a black swan event, an unexpected event, and there have been structural changes. Stru when I say structural, I mean changes to how the, the different variables in the economy, the different actors in the economy, changes to how they re react to one another. And so when we forecast, we look at history, and we are um, we're estimating the relationships among lots of different variables in the economy. What happens, what's the relationship between changes in labor supply and changes in wages? Um, for instance, uh, what's, the, what's the relationship between um, tax rates and uh, you know, be, behavior changes? So we look at those that, and we use those correlations of those relationships to forecast forward. But when we have a disruption in the economy that might have changed some of those relationships, it means that forecasting going forward is more fraught. And, uh, and forecasts become more variable. This one, however, um, this is actually very easily explained uh, because in November, um, S&P assumed a much lower rate of growth at the end of 23 and so, and then what turned out to be the case. 
Uh, that was true for lots of forecasters. So I don't know if you remember, so sort of think back to when you learned about the fourth quarter growth of 2023. Um, it was, I, I characterized it as unexpectedly strong. It was really a surprise, and it was the headline of all the, the economic and financial news. So economic growth at... Um, as of the time the S&P released their February forecast, the estimate from BEA was 3.3% growth at the end of 23. S&P had it at 0.8%, I think. Um, that's, I can double check that because uh, I'm not positive that's the number, but it was much lower than 3.3. Since then, the, B, the BEA second estimate is there was 3.2% growth. So. We're moving along through 23. S&P produces their forecast in November with um, thinking that they, ha they, they have an estimate for what uh, fourth quarter 23 growth is. Fourth quarter 23 growth comes in much higher. They also had in their um, November estimate different assumptions about what the Fed was going to do. And so come January and then February, they adjusted their forecast for 20, 23 and 24 up. So as I said, that... that faster growth at the end of the year, S&P assumes some of that is carrying through into 24. Senator Draham, anything further? Representative Pinto. Thank you, Chairs, uh, and thanks to our um, amazing testifiers and for your work, appreciate it. Um, so I have kind of a multifaceted question. Um, uh, relating to, um, I guess, w wondering first if uh, one of the constraints on productivity is a worker shortage. I feel like we hear quite a bit about this and wondering both if that's true and if, um, uh, if the numbers would reflect at all any efforts made in last session to, uh, in the last session, to invest in workers and in people, sort of get more people off the bench. I'm thinking both uh, worker shortage as a problem in terms of revenue, you know, as, as folks are, are involved in our economy more, there's more revenue, but also if they're not in the workforce, then there may be that they're um, more involved in public services and then be on the cost side as well. So just wondering about, uh, it's sort of a, a general question, hopefully it makes sense to you. Thanks. Dr. Kalmakidis. Um, Madam Chair, um, Chairs, uh, representative members of the committee, um, you, this is this is a big question. There is a lot of economics in your question, so um, so get your pencils out. Um, <laughs> so you talked about you were asking about the relationship between uh, labor supply and labor productivity, mm -hmm. and they are related, uh, not in the sense that labor supply. Res re um, constrains productivity, but here's how they're related, um, is that as we have slow labor force growth, which is demographically driven because the, uh, the, baby, the very large baby boom generation is continuing to age out of the workforce, we have slow labor force growth, so employers find it more difficult to fill open positions. As they do that, um, a couple of things are happening. Uh, one is they raise wages in order to attract workers, the workers that are out there. And so at wages per worker go up. So simple supply and demand, wages per worker go up. That can attract people who might have might not be in the workforce, can attract them in. So higher wages, somebody who is, say, doing something else like taking care of a family member, taking care of kids, the household, they adjust their um, they're thinking, uh, you know, now you can, your, um, what's called your, your opportunity cost, because the wage you could get is higher, we're going to rethink our, assist, uh, what our plan for the household, and we're going to have both people work, both um, parents work. Um, so that's, a, that's, higher wages can draw people who otherwise, who have chosen to do something else to join the workforce. Um, and employers who are struggling to find workers uh, invest in technology, equipment, processes that raise the productivity of each worker. That means they're producing the same amount of stuff, but with fewer workers. And think about all of the changes that happened post-pandemic, um, especially in service areas. So think about the restaurants you go to where um, you no longer have someone bring you a menu, but you scan the, scan the menu. And so, there, or you, you, know, you fill your own, own cup at the, um, the pop station. These are, and then also, you know, uh, more sort of fancier technologies in, you know, computer systems and um, 
assembly lines that employers figure out how to create, produce the same amount of stuff with fewer workers, and so they invest more in product productivity enhancing equipment and processes. When they do that, so they invest more in these productivity enhancing, enhancing equipment, technology, processes, the people doing those things may need additional training, the people using that new technology, um, they can command a higher wage because they're more productive. And so that also raises wages per worker. So that's the reason why um, when, I'm just gonna scroll back to our final slide. Um, that's the reason why when I said that we have we have stable growth in total payrolls per worker going forward. That is what's baked into that is this slow labor force growth, okay? Um, how can we have stable growth in total wages while we have slow labor force growth? Um, it's because these wages per worker go up. So there are, so policies that um, get put into place that can lower barriers to work can bring people, we don't have a lot of people on the sidelines, I'll just say. We don't have a deep bench in Minnesota, and we haven't for a long time. We have a high labor force participation rate relative to the US and relative to other states. So, but to the extent that there are people who, who are not in the labor force, policies that lower labor, um, lower barriers to work, and actions by employers themselves to raise wages and invest in productivity enhancing equipment, these things, can bring, um, can uh, potentially increase the labor force. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Dr. Colin Mikita. So um, would, uh, to the extent that there are policies that were enacted that would bring more people in or have those effects that you just described, would the forecast reflect that, you know, let's say in the, um, in the tails, uh, in terms of there being a likelihood of there being, you know, more growth, Again, fewer service. I, I mean, when I'm thinking about people on the sidelines, I guess I'm thinking also that labor force participation rate is measured. I, I think there may be some folks that um, uh, there may be policies that, that can be enacted to, uh, to bring more folks in, I suppose. And just wondering um, to what extent the, the forecast would, would reflect any of that, those policies. Dr. Coleman Kiedis. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Members, uh, no. The, um, we, I would have to see in, in data that uh, labor force participation is changing um, and that labor force growth is changing um, before I would have the confidence to, um, to project that further. So what's baked into this forecast is, is modest, very low labor force growth that's driven by demographics. You'd Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. So maybe just the final point, um, or just a, a thought here, is that what we're seeing then here is a reflection of investments made in past years and decades, and our state has had that, that path we've taken, and I think in, so successfully, both economically and also in terms of the welfare of our residents. But it sounds like, and it totally makes sense to me, that we wouldn't be able to see uh, to the extent that that even last session we put our state on an even better path in that way, we kind of wouldn't see that in the data here. <clears throat> it's not even data, right? The, the projections, because as you say, you kind of need to see that before including it. So that makes total sense to me from your perspective, but I guess maybe just for us to be thinking about that, um, the power of, of investing in people. Thank you. Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, this will take us back to slide 16, and the question is for... Um, um, on the health and human service portion of this, um, as you know, I'm doing a legislative task force on aging and looking at how aging is going to impact our expenses going forward and how we make Minnesota a state where everyone can age and live in a vibrant uh, capacity, right? So um, when we're looking at those long-term care programs that uh, that's a pretty significant swing that you said is driven primarily by the cost of long-term care programming. Would, could you please expand upon that just a little bit? Director Mingi. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, Representative Cleborn. So there are um, a number of things going on in the Health and Human Services forecast, and certainly um, the story in this forecast and the story in the previous forecast in terms of changes from our previous estimates, what we're cost increases due to long-term care. Um, 
In this forecast, the change, growth in long-term care programs increased state spending by $31 million in this biennium and $43 million in the next. And as a reminder, that there we're talking about just changes from where we were in November, not changes over time, which I want to address um, as well. But in these sort of forecast to forecast changes are primarily driven um, in the CADI program, Community Access for Disability Inclusion, which is a medical assistance waiver service for people with disabilities. And here we are um, it's largely both more people on the program as well as higher average costs on the program. And that was the story in November as well, where we saw much larger changes to in the hundreds of millions of dollars due to both higher participation and higher average costs. Um, Long-term care services, both for facilities like nursing facilities and our disability waiver programs are also programs that have um, inflationary estimates built into their statutory formula. So as costs go over time, there are periodic adjustments, which is one of the reasons that we see sort of faster growth in these programs, as well as due to higher participation. So what we've seen is participation in community-based settings has grown significantly over time. In facility settings, um, that's not necessarily the case, but those, as a reminder, are our most expensive settings. Um, but um, the last point I'll make is to the question of growth in spending over time. So for long-term care um, facilities, in 2024, we're projecting about $584 million, so that's an annual number. But by 2027, we're projecting total state spending of $688 million. And then when you look at the long-term care waiver forecast, which is much larger, in 2024, the um, spending is $3 billion, but by 2027, it goes to $3.9 billion. So it just significant increases across the horizon, and as um, as demographics in society change, I think those are trends we have to continue to monitor and sort of look forward to even beyond our forecast horizon. Thank you very much. Representative Edelson. The Senate has such a nice building. <laughs> All right, well, so I wanted to uh, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was great, very helpful. Um, I just wanna echo what uh, my colleague here said. I'm, I'm genuinely worried about our state's population and the unemployment rate to me seems quite low. I'm curious, I know there's debate among, among economists on this issue, do you think it's low? Do you think our fiscal history of going into our, our fiscal future is concerning? Dr. coleman Um Representative, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, the, the reason I emphasized the relationship between slow employment growth and modest um, or and stable total wage growth, and so I, I said, that means that wages per work, in order for this story to hold together and the forecast to hold, then wages per worker have to go up because we are projecting Low labor, continued low labor force growth and continued slow employment growth. Um, the reason I emphasize that is because that's, that's a risk in this, um, in this outlook. That in order for this forecast to hold, the story that I've told about productivity and wages growing, going up, that has to, that has to hold. Um, it's positive shocks, you know, unexpected things that uh, befall the economy that change could change labor force growth, um, could change that in a positive way. Negative shocks can change it in a negative way. So um, the, I think that's the um, slow labor force growth is um, the biggest challenge in Minnesota's economy right now. Vice Chair Edelson, anything further? I would just say that we as a state need to truly think about this. I mean, if you look at by 20, 2040, what's not in this is the projections of our state and the population growth. But by 2040, 21% of our population will be 65 or older. The costs are gonna be very high and we are not growing our workforce. So this is something as a state, I think we really need to focus on. Uh, Representative Howard. Thank you. Uh, to all the members here and for the presentation. Um, you know, I wanted to note that the, the $1.3 billion change in just a few months is pretty significant. Um, 
And I'm curious if we have any um, insights in terms of where we are in the forecast cycle, where we're projecting out 26, 27, based on previous times we've been in this place. How often do we get it even close to correct when we're forecasting this far out and trying to think about 26, 27? Dr. Kalmakidis. Um, Madam Chair, uh, representative members of the committee, I can only speak to the revenue forecast, um, so not to changes in the, the whole bottom line. We publish, two weeks following every forecast, we publish a report on our forecast uncertainty, so the difference between actuals and forecast. And we calculate that difference, that forecast error or forecast uncertainty, we calculate that difference um, for every time a biennium is forecast, starting with the first February that is forecast, I believe. So, you know, X number of months out, um, you know, seven months out, 15, I can't remember the, the pattern anymore. But, and so we report the percentage that we have been off um, for each of those, uh, however far out from closing of that biennium we are. I don't have those numbers in front of me, um, but we will. We ha did report it two weeks following the November forecast, and we will report it in a week or so. And so those numbers will then be available to you. And the pattern is, of course, it makes sense that the closer we get to the end of the biennium, the smaller those errors become. Um, the pattern is also, I talked about the volatility um, during, since the pandemic, during that negative shock to the economy and on all the unexpected things that happened, our forecast errors went up during that period. Representative Howard. Uh, thank you, uh, that's helpful. And my other question is about sort of trend lines. Um, and again, we can't sort of forecast a really unexpected shock like a global pandemic. Um, but my perception, as of late, and by as of late, I mean the last several years, um, we, outside of a large event like the pandemic, we, we start, when things are going well, we've seen a trend line continue. I'm thinking back decades ago when, uh, in, after the Great Recession when things weren't going well, we saw that trend. Is my perception correct that, um, uh, you, you know, we often see uh, gradual trend lines versus like big departures um, outside of kind of major shocks to the economy? Dr. Colin Makitas. Um, Madam Chair, Representative, do you, let me just ask a clarifying question here. Do you mean, do you mean gradual changes, meaning changes in the, in the forecast or forecast error, or do you mean economic I, forecast changes? I guess I mean the trend, so what, what I'm noting is we've had several forecasts where the trend has been positive. We, we continue to see economic growth, growth in revenues, growth in budget surpluses, healthier budgets, mm -hmm. um, without a sharp U-turn, mm -hmm. you know, th in the other direction. It mm -hmm. seems to me that what we've seen, um, we haven't seen those sharp U-turns uh, outside of something that's really hard to predict, like mm -hmm. a global pandemic. And I'm just curious if that's oh, okay. y your reaction to that. Dr. Colin Makitas, um, Madam Chair, uh, representative members of the committee. Um, we, if you look at, looking at the history, so this, this history of our forecasts and how far off they are, what you, what you find is that they, they sort of chase or lag the business cycle, right? So as things are, things are improving in the economy, we're sort of, catching up to that. And our economic forecasts are improving and our revenue forecasts are improving. And then there, we haven't seen a U-turn since, as you describe it, since the pandemic. We will, there will be another U.S. recession. And so when recessions occur, whether they are because of a, an unexpected shock like the pandemic or because of something else, um, the, you know, we make a U-turn and we start taking money out of the, the economic forecast changes and we start taking money out of our revenue forecast. So the pattern of revenue forecast changes um, follows the business cycle, follows the economic cycle. Um, the smallest forecast errors we saw in the time that I've been doing this were in the 10 years 
of steady economic growth, the, the unprecedented 10-year expansion that ended with the pandemic. So during those years when the economy was just sort of continuing to grow without lots of ups and downs, that was when, it, when revenues were easiest to forecast. Representative Howard. Th that's helpful. And then just to, just to comment, um, I'll be really curious to see what the numbers look like, uh, the, the monthly updates in March and in April, to see if we continue to see this trend line. Um, hopefully we continue to see uh, this growth. Um, and then just my, my overall comment when thinking this, when I heard this report, um, I was really taken back to the, the end of the session, during the session when we heard uh, so many folks, uh, corporate special interests and others say the sky is gonna fall. If you pass a budget like this, people are gonna exit the state immediately. You're gonna see this chilling effect on business. And you know what we're seeing is that just isn't playing out. Uh, the growth in our revenues is from a, our corporations um, that are seeing really high growth and we're seeing growth everywhere. And I just wanna remind folks to, that that tracks with the budget we passed, a budget that um, did ask corporations to pay their fair share, um, targeting things like uh, guilty and, and profits overseas and a budget that invested in families and their economic issues most important to them, their, their housing, their childcare, their healthcare. Um, and what we're seeing in this forecast is that um, we can sort of stop listening to the corporations that cry wolf when they say that when you raise taxes, the sky is gonna fall. Rather, what we should take from is that when we invest in Minnesotans and grow our economy by uh, putting power and more control and faith in Minnesota families, we'll see growth. That's what I think we see in this report, and I think we'll see even more growth, as Representative Pinto mentioned, um, as more of the changes we passed last year are implemented. So to me, the takeaway is let's keep our eye on the prize, keep our foot on the gas, and keep investing in Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two members still on the list, and I just want to pause to say if you are on Zoom and you want to speak, if you would just raise your hand, we'll have our committee administrator note that, or if you're having any technical issues, you can email um, committee administrators too to let them know, um, but wanted to say that. And Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you uh, for that. So I want to go back to your discussion and your answer to Representative Pinto's question. and and just so, so I can understand it, I'm gonna paraphrase it and let you know whether or not I got it right. Uh, my understanding is that growth and productivity is a key indicator of, of a healthy economy, et cetera. And, and I think what I heard you say was that wage increases itself uh, doesn't generate increased productivity directly. Uh, that instead, um, uh, job creators, investment in enhancements, and skill level increases by employees uh, with higher wages could could impact that, that that is the pr more of the primary indicator of um, cor corporate growth. Is, is that correct, GDP? Dr. Colin Makitas. Um, Madam Chair, uh, uh, representative members of the committee. Um, so it's not, so I'm, I'm let me, you, you, st you're, you started by asking or s saying um, wage growth itself isn't, does not generate productivity, that's correct. That's right. Um, they're related, of course, it's all part of the labor market, but uh, employers who have open positions and can't, are, are struggling to find people to fill those positions have a number of choices in front of them. One is, can they, is their margin such that they can raise wages? And if they, because it's, you know, they're the buyers in this tight labor market and so raise the price. Uh, and so if you raise wages, you might attract people into those open positions. You can, so you can do that if your margin allows it, because um, higher wages is a cost to business, of course. Um, you can try, you can recruit different groups of people. You can look to groups that maybe you've overlooked before. Uh, you know, you recruit differently. You can change the job somewhat, make it, you know, change, make it more flexible, make, change the conditions. Um, make it part-time, full-time, you know, whatever it is that the workers are, are looking for. Um, and you can invest in technology that allows you to produce the same amount of stuff with fewer workers. Um, and productivity is, okay, so we're connecting stories here from the, 
this is, this is nice. We're connecting stories from the labor market story to the GDP growth story. So investments in uh, techno new technologies to improve productivity can boost economic growth going forward, um, and that is that can be healthy for the economy. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, and, and to follow up with that, so you know I understand that. Um, a, company that builds specific widgets mm -hmm. and they don't have enough labor to do it and they raise their wages in order to do it, they're still producing the same amount of widgets at a time in which it increases costs. So mm -hmm. uh, to me, um, that is, is higher wages certainly fills it, those gaps, but it doesn't really improve productivity at the time, but also increases the cost. So mm -hmm. is there also a direct or indirect relationship to increased wages and inflation? Dr. Um, Madam Chair, representative members of the committee, uh, there can be, there, uh, there can be wage increases uh, across the economy uh, can be correlated with inflation when they are accompanied by um, productivity increases, then they tend not to be, they're less likely to be inflationary. So that's why that's so that they can boost uh, GDP growth without increasing inflation, um, and whether or not wage growth increases prices, which is inflation, depends on the margin for the the profit margin for the company. Can they afford to pay higher wages without increasing prices? It also depends on the structure of the industry that the company's in. So some in some industries, um, firms have enough market power to push cost increases into increased prices, and consumers are just gonna keep buying them. Some companies don't. Some companies are um, pay, uh, selling a product that where the price is determined in a global market, and they can't raise prices. And so they would either have to squeeze their, have their margin squeezed, or which is lower profits, or they'd have to find some other way to um, pay for that increased wage costs. Representative Peters. Yeah, thank you. And I'll j just comment. I, I think what you're what you're saying is that really we're looking at a combination of a lot of different things. But uh, bottom line is is the corporations are, are having to figure out being ways of being innovative and creating and increasing productivity uh, with the dynamics that that are in front of them. And and that's an important piece. And I think it's always be true. Uh, that uh, those that are entrepreneurs and, and innovators uh, find ways of getting uh, able to do more things with less. And, and that's an important piece. It, it also means sometimes less employees, which also doesn't help the unemployment rates uh, per se as well. But uh, I thank you for, for your input and insight, and, and I thank you. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, all three of you, for your for your uh, presentation today. I, I know it can't be easy, so I hope you don't view this as picking on your process. We're just trying to understand. Um, with, with the discussion on the labor force, um, you know, it's always puzzled me that, you know, when we, when I came in in 17 into the Senate, you know, we had a, a, a workforce participation rate at 70. And, and of course, we've gone down since. I know it's the fifth highest among states now, but for Minnesota standards, mm -hmm. it's one of the lowest. But w when you look at the numbers on on the DEED website for our workforce, what's, what's available for a workforce? Mm -hmm. and, and it's back when I came in, it was uh, 3 million, 60,000, something like that, somewhere in there. Um, and then today we're at 3.1 million in that workforce group, uh, according to DEED. Um, but our populations grow. And, you know, I, I think back then we were at like 5.5 and change million in 2017, and we're at 5.7 and change today. So can you just help us understand um, with the growth in population, why hasn't our workforce grown more? Mm. Dr. Kalamakitis. 
um, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, members of the committee. The labor force participation rate is the share of the civilian population that is over age 16, the uninstitutionalized civilian population over age 16 that is in the labor force. The labor force is just to give a little background so that I, my, my answer hopefully will make sense. Um, the labor force is everybody who is either working or is unemployed and looking for work. So labor force participation rate is that labor force, the share of the over 16 population that is either working or looking for work. Um, we had had, yes, that's, I remember that 70 point whatever labor force participation rate seemed, seemed very high at, at the time, and it was. Um, and our labor force participation rate for Minnesota is lower. It, so the rate we have now is low relative to our history and the peaks of our history. Um, but it remains high relative to the U.S. and relative to other states. Why is that? It's because of aging of the workforce, aging of the population. So it's that population that is looking at the, the denominator of this, this fraction. It's the population over age 16. So as you, it's not the population from, that's working age. So um, as your population ages, so as a larger share of your population gets to be 65, 70, 80, that number is going to shrink. And so that is the overarching, the largest reason why Minnesota's labor force participation rate has come down since 2017. Um, it has come down because more of our population is of retirement age. And so that trend was happening before the recession and the recession exacerbated it in every state because lots of people who were, might have worked longer found themselves in the, in the pandemic recession um, saying, you know what, I can retire, therefore I will. And so they left. Some of those people are, have come back since as conditions have changed. Um, but the reason why we have maintained a labor force participation rate that's high relative to other states and high relative to the U.S. is because we have high participation in Minnesota. Um, the reason it's lower than it was uh, before the uh, for years before the pandemic is because the population has continued to age. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the answer. Um, you know, I, I'm just surprised, though, we haven't really grown in that segment um, because, yes, we have an aging population, but we don't cut off the labor participation rate because you said it was 16 plus, mm -hmm. so there's no cap on age. Um, and, and, and I assume most of the people that are coming from previous testimony and other committees um, were, were younger than retirement mm -hmm. age. Um, so if, if we're importing people from outside of Minnesota, um, a half a million or, I, I don't know, 300,000, whatever the number is, um, you know, why aren't we seeing it in our workforce, I guess, because they would technically be of working age and that that number has bounced around over the last eight years um, but it really doesn't show a correlation to our population growth so I'm just wondering if, if you guys have looked at that um, is that a, a trend we'll continue to see um, higher high, higher population in the state but less people participating in the workforce yeah. Dr. Colin Makitas. Um, Madam Chair, Senator, members of the committee. Um, this, is a, this is a great question for the state demographer who I've seen do presentations on those numbers. So here's the number of people coming in, here are their ages, here's what's happening to the labor force. So um, uh, my, I, I don't wanna get um, you know, too far over my skis here because I'm not the demographer, but my understanding is that the larger share of people coming into the state are younger. A lot of them are kids, so they're not yet in the labor force. Um, and the, one of the things that can, that could raise our participation rate would be anything that lowers the average age of people in Minnesota. And so if people come, if we do get more of an influx of people coming in who are younger, that's going to be very positive for, um, for Minnesota's uh, economy going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Let's go to Representative Gomez. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks so much for uh, the presentation. Um, of course, probably no surprise that I was really interested and, and thankful that you spent a lot of time talking about um, corporate tax revenue and corporate profits. Um, you know, we get those uh, monthly revenue reports from our fiscal staff, and in January, I, the the forecasted increase in corporate collections um, went up 80 percent since the from the, you know the, what we actually collected versus what was. Um, part of the November forecast. And so, you know, that does tell a certain story. Um, and part of it is, is about this, this kind of context in which, in which corporations thrive. Uh, they don't, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, that happens in, in, in our state, in our state where we've made certain choices, where we choose to invest in our people, where we choose to invest in education. We have a highly educated workforce. We have, you know, good infrastructure. We have good fundamentals. Um, we, we did also hear uh, yesterday in the tax committee just some, some information um, from a presenter about uh, corporate consolidation, um, about what the, the these, these uh, the kind of consolidation of corporate power in our country has an impact on revenues. Yes, because as corporations have consolidated over time, they have become more and more profitable as they sort of are able to exercise um, that power in the economy. It also has an impact on our democracy, on uh, you know many other elements kind of, of, of the world that we all live in. And um, you know, I, I do just wanna, wanna say, I th there's sort of a little bit of a story about about Minnesota and about Democrats, and you know, I think I got accused of trying to jam the corporations yesterday. Um, <clears throat> but you know, the fact is that when we're really talking, when you, you kind of dig in a little bit deeper, we're really talking about those very those largest corporations, those highest profit corporations, really, really kind of um, getting so much of the benefits in this economy. And when in all of our districts, I, you know, I, I just don't think this is a partisan issue. I think that if you go to any of our districts and you talk to your constituents and you ask them what, what they think about the fact that some of the largest corporations actually have no tax liability, some of the richest individuals in, in our country actually have no tax liability. Like, is that fair? Does that seem fair to our local businesses, to our mom and pop businesses, to our main street businesses that don't have the fancy accounting departments that can, you know, stash their profits and intellectual property in, in Bermuda. Like, is that fair? Is this economy fair to people, to working people? Is this economy, you know, easy for a working class person to make to make a life for themselves and their families? And increasingly, you know, the answer to that is no. Is that it's 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 harder for smaller businesses. It's harder for for um, you know individuals, and so as we do look at this, at overall, a, you know, a really good picture for our state, and and the fact that we're on very really sound um, economic footing, uh, we we also just kind of have to push back against this assertion that you know that we're being unfair to corporations by, for example, by having a corporate franchise tax. Um, you know, the story of of what of corporations' profits versus the taxes that they've paid over the last 50 years is one where we see ballooning profits and lower and lower um, tax collections by government, even though, again, um, you know, corporations exist in this context where they count on investments by government in order, in order to thrive. And in 2017, the corporate franchise tax at the federal level was cut by 40%. And, um, you know, I, I did this uh, this bill when I first got in office uh, to to say, hey, what would we have had to do to our corporate rate in order to make up for that rate cut that they got at at the federal level? And it was like you would have had to tax them at 40 or 45 percent. Um, and so we have we have political decisions that contribute to you know greater stacking up of profits, which really corporate profits for the most part. Um, benefit shareholders, they benefit highly compensated CEOs. Not as many of those benefits kind of trickle down to us. 
as you know, um, as corporate collections are less than 10% of our revenue mix um, in Minnesota. But I, I just, you know, we kind of, we have to be willing to, to, to engage on this issue and to, and, and you know, my assertion and I, I think like our assertion is that the value proposition of Minnesota is not that we're a low tax, no tax jurisdiction. Um, it's not that we're a place where, you know, you're gonna come and benefit from from our good workforce and and you know our the healthy environment that we're able to maintain and the investments in healthcare and housing and you know care for our elders and folks with disabilities and not pitch into the common good. And so I'm I'm thankful that we're moving that we're you know on a good path economically and that that value proposition of Minnesota, right, which is like the, a good life and everybody pitching in to help each other um, seems to me to be on a good path. And so thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we are getting close to wrapping. I know we have a hard stop at 10 and I want to acknowledge a lot of our members on Zoom also had other responsibilities. So I know Lead Garofalo is not able to be here and I did offer last words to our GOP leads before we close here. But I do know that Senator Pratt um, will, will has some remarks as well, and then we'll have Senator Marty close us out. But I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for your work on this and helping to give us a clear picture so that we as policymakers can make the decisions we need to make. Um, and I just wanted to just, can, if I can ask one question too, just more getting back into the budget. Um, you know, the talk of inflation, that was something we spent a lot of time in hearing you kind of have more detail in this conversation today, I think was helpful to all of us. Um, around the discretionary spending. But I did want to note, you know, when we see on slide 17, you don't need to go back there, but the, you know, budget at the 70.5 billion going down to the 66 billion. Um, and you mentioned, even though it's discretionary spending, it is, even with the decrease, we have already decided, by, or we haven't decided, it is in the forecast as, forecast as if we will spend that 842 million. Um, we have decisions to make about how we do that, but the assumption is even with a decrease in our budget and showing a structural imbalance, we also are still in order, even with that structural imbalance there, we have, we are using that inflation money in the 66 billion dollars. Does that make sense? I just want to make sure I'm like crystal clear on, because I think there's some assumption that that 842 million is out there but it is actually a part of our assumed spending in the 66 billion. D Director Mingi. Madam Chair, that's correct. If, um, if you were to take the inflation number out, it would, it would be less than the 66.3 billion, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that clarification. I know it got technical again at the end here, but, um, and with that, I will turn it over to um, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, thank you members for coming. Um, you know, thank you, Dr. Kalamakitis. I've, I've uh, appreciated the, the uh, opportunity to sit in on uh, meetings with the Council of Economic Advisors. If, if you haven't had that opportunity, it's, it's fascinating sometimes. It's also a little bit frustrating because uh, Dr. Kalamakitis will get some forecast data and then uh, Chair Powell will come out and speak on the Fed and basically blow it up uh, in, some, in some cases. What I want to really touch on here, though, is, you know, to me, this is a forecast based on rose, a rosy outlook. And I think it's hiding some of the problems that, that we face. We've heard a lot about corporate taxes. The, the improvement that we've seen in the forecast is based on an improved outlook in the corporate tax collections. And it's one of the most volatile pieces of our budget that we face. It's, it's written in the report that it's warned that it's extremely volatile. And I'm concerned that we're putting so much emphasis on that increased tax collection number when we may see that corporations haven't fully, and businesses haven't fully uh, reacted to the tax uh, changes that were put into law last year. And so when we start looking at this and we start patting ourselves on the back, I'm concerned about that, that hidden risk. Um, you 
we have an administration that doesn't have a very good track record of forecasting. Since last session, MA spending is gonna be up over a billion over the next two biennium over what we projected. We talked about, Director Mingi uh, talked about um, how special education was impacting the education budget. And one of the easiest things to forecast was the school lunch program. 40% of our variance to where we expected to be last session is just simply based on the school lunch program. So the Walls Flanagan administration has not done a very good job of informing this legislature on making decisions. Now we're talking about a larger bonding bill. A bonding bill that's based on the assumption that we're gonna see a decrease in rates. You know, earlier this year, I remember sitting on the, on the call with the economic advisors and we were talking about a 50-50 percentage probability of a rate cut in March and, and uh, about a 90% probability in May. Now if you look at the now, if you look at the, at the landscape, we're talking, you know, March is off the table, and the probability of a May rate cut is down to about 30, and discussions about whether there'll even be a rate cut in a presidential election year. It's, and I wanna to touch a little bit on what, you know, Representative Edelson said, because this came up during our review of the forecast with, uh, uh, with MMB and, and uh, uh, Dr. Kalamakitis, you know, I, admittedly I hang out with a group of people who are closer to the end of their careers than, than the beginning. And anecdotally, I mentioned that a lot of people, a lot of our friends are taking and moving to other states with lower tax burdens. They're taking their savings with them. They're taking their retirement savings with them. And I was corrected in that a lot of our out-migration, a lot of our workforce that's moving out of the state are those at the beginning of their career. New college grads that are moving out and they're taking not just the assets they have today, but the assets that they will grow in the future. That is not a good outlook for the workforce of the state of Minnesota and for the fiscal health that we expect to go forward. And let's not forget that we're still, that, that when we entered 2023, we had a $5 billion structural surplus. That's gone. We're projecting a $1.5 billion structural imbalance. That's a structural deficit. We are spending more than we're collecting. But I'm really, if you look at page 10, if that doesn't keep you up at night, I don't know what will. Because that's about $440 million in, in page 10 of the full report, members, not. <laughs> but that's $440 million in fiscal 26, and that jumps to over a billion dollars of imbalance in 2027. And if we stay on that trend, when we come back next session and we start setting the budget, we're gonna be facing a fiscal cliff. So when I say that we have on the surface pretty good forecast, I'm concerned about what's not being discussed in this forecast and I'm talking about the risks. The risks of a downside Dr. Colin McKee has talked about it. The risk of a downside is twice as probable as the risk of upside to the current forecast. And I can tell you, as someone who worked in corporate America for a long time and did a lot of forecasting, I can tell you that every forecast is wrong. I've never, if, and if anybody hits a forecast dead on the nose, they were cheating. Um, and so, members, I think we have to be very cautious as we head into this. And I'm actually, 
um, you know, somewhat encouraged by the comments uh, made by uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talking about fiscal responsibility because I think they're starting to recognize that this could actually be a house of cards that crumbles on top of us. And, and I hope that we go in um, very judiciously and we start to address the spending deficit that we're going to be facing in the next biennium. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members and witnesses. I wanted to uh, first of all say I do agree with Senator Pratt on one point, and that is that we should be cautious as we move forward. But I also want to caution that we do not politicize the budget forecasting process. It's done by nonpartisan staff and economists who do a very professional thing. And our state has been fortunate in the fact that bipartisan basis, we've accepted the forecast. So I urge us not to politicize this and accept it as the professionals who do. And yes, no forecast is going to be right when you said unless they cheat. I don't know how you could cheat on knowing what the future is going to be. But, but they're doing the best they can and there are upsides and downsides and they're trying to forecast that and to suggest that an administration is trying to hide this. It's not partisan administration. It's nonpartisan economists who are putting this together. So I urge us to think that. In terms of the people moving in and out of the state, um, yes, there are people of all ages that move in and out, and, and in terms of the young people moving out, that's why I think I'm so excited about the North Star Promise and the higher education affordability that was put in last year. When North Dakota actually had a little crisis because we were going to not be sending as many people to North Dakota because they'd find it more affordable to go to school in Minnesota, and I strongly agree we want to keep the young people from moving out, and I think that's what that kind of process does. So I'm, I agree with I think everybody here that there's some really good news in this forecast, but we're on the same direction we have to be. We have to be cautious. And one final comment, when we talk about structural imbalance, structural imbalances, we had to have them if we have to, if we're planning to spend one-time money. If, you, if you're gonna spend no more in revenue than you have revenue coming in and not have a structural imbalance, then you're leaving the money on the table as was done two years earlier. If you're gonna spend down the one-time money, that's going to cause a structural imbalance. We had a 9.5 billion in the current biennium, it's going down to one and a half billion, less than one and a half billion in the next one, and that's appropriate for the way to do it, but that also speaks to why we have to have money carried over because we can't continue to have structural imbalances. We've had them because we had a huge balance. That huge balance is going away. We have to level out so we have no structural imbalances in the future. But I think we're on the process to do that. I think everybody here recognizes the importance of caution. And with that, I want to thank again State Economist, State Budget Director, and Commissioner of MMB for your presentations. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>